Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about one of the things they snuck into Bill C-21 in committee. And Bill C-21 is the liberal gun restriction bill. And it started out with a whole bunch of things, but now it's been growing and growing and growing as they keep adding more things that they want to do with this bill. So what I'm talking about today is something that should be concerning to every gun owner. And in fact, everybody who really believes in due process. And this is a clause that is potentially going to have some huge impact and also will facilitate the racist use of this law. So let's talk about this. And this is a particular clause they've added in here. It says, if a chief firearms officer has reasonable grounds to suspect that an individual who holds a license may have engaged in an act of domestic violence or stalking, the chief firearms officer must revoke the license within 24 hours. And you might be saying, what's the problem with that? Well, we'll get to that, but it's really located in the reasonable grounds to suspect. So now they define domestic violence. They note uh, for the purpose of this, it means conduct, whether or not it constitutes a criminal offense. So it doesn't have to be illegal conduct by a family member towards another family member, including conduct by or towards an intimate partner that is violent or threatening, or that is part of a pattern of coercive and controlling behavior, or that cause other family member or intimate partner to fear for their safety or the safety of another person and includes a physical abuse, including forced confinement, but excluding the use of reasonable force to protect themselves or another person. Of course, reasonable grounds to suspect is going to completely annihilate that as we'll see, uh, B sexual abuse, C psychological abuse, D financial abuse, E threats to kill or cause bodily harm to any person. F, threats to kill or harm an animal or damaged property. Harassment, including stalking. The failure to provide the necessities of life and the killing or harming of an animal or the damaging of property. And you might think, hey, that's not such a big deal. This is, um, all of this is bad stuff. The issue here isn't with the list. It's with the standard. It's with the test. Because the standard that they've imposed here is reasonable grounds to suspect. And this isn't a situation where they may revoke a license and we'll have to do some decision making about it. It's once they determine that they have reasonable grounds to suspect, they must revoke a license. So there's no discretion at that point. Now, what does it mean for reasonable grounds to suspect? Well, this is a standard that exists in the criminal law, and it's a standard that's used for certain, um, certain kinds of searches, usually, as opposed to arrest. And it's a lower standard than reasonable and probable grounds to believe. The standard is described in the case of the Queen and Chahill and many other cases, but this is just a good one to look at it. And it notes, thus, while reasonable grounds to suspect and reasonable and probable grounds to believe are similar in that they both must be grounded in objective facts, reasonable suspicion is a lower standard as it engages the reasonable possibility rather than probability of crime. As a result, when applying the reasonable suspicion standard, reviewing judges must be cautious not to conflate it with the more demanding reasonable and probable ground standard. It continues on to say, the fact that reasonable suspicion deals with possibilities rather than probabilities necessarily means in some cases the police will reasonably suspect that innocent people are involved in crime. So this is a real low standard. It's not just you have engaged in domestic violence. It's that it's possible you've engaged in domestic violence. And this case sort of goes on and talks about some other aspects of it. They say, uh, further reasonable suspicion need not be the only inference that can be drawn from a particular constellation of factors. Much as the seven stars that form the Big Dipper have been interpreted as a bear, a saucepan, and a plow, factors that give rise to reasonable suspicion may also support completely innocent explanations. This is acceptable as the reasonable suspicion standard addresses the possibility of uncovering criminality and not a probability of doing so. They go on to say, uh, however, the obligation of the police to take all factors into account does not impose a duty to undertake further investigation to seek out exculpatory factors or rule out possible innocent explanations. As was noted in United States and Sokolow, uh, the relevant inquiry is not whether particular conduct is innocent or guilty, 
but the degree of suspicion that attaches to particular types of non-criminal acts. In conducting this inquiry to ascertain whether reasonable suspicion was present, the court will assess the circumstances the police were aware of at the time of the execution of the search. This was a search case, not a, a firearm seizure case or anything like that including those learned after the decision to deploy the sniffer dog was made if there was a delay in deployment, as there was in this case. However, it would not be permissible for the reasonable suspicion inquiry to assess circumstances learned after the execution of the search. So they must take your license if they have reasonable suspicion, and they don't need to look into whether there's an innocent explanation or whether there's something that would clear you on this. So, you know, this, there must be the possibility that there was domestic violence, but not even the probability of domestic violence. So you can lose your guns and potentially, I mean, if you have uh, handguns or prohibited firearms, you won't get those back even if later you're able to apply for a license. That'll be, those will just be lost entirely. And those might be worth tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and if, you know, you might not be able to hunt, you might not be able to any of these things based on the mere possibility that you have, you know, committed some offense, which doesn't even need to be a criminal offense, according to this law. So this is, I think, really concerning, especially because there is the real possibility for this to be uh, applied unevenly. And what I mean by that is that let's say the police show up for a noise complaint and they arrive at your house and you know they've the neighbors said that they heard shouting well you and your wife both say hey listen nothing happened you know sure you heard shouting we were you know we had an argument but nobody threw anything nobody threatened to kill anybody nobody took a swing nobody any of that we just argued right um it happens sometimes in relationships or maybe it's even just we weren't doing anything. We were watching a loud movie and in the movie, people got into a fight, but we didn't. We were just watching the movie. Maybe it was a little loud. Sorry about that. Now, the police will then basically be assessing whether or not they believe you and whether or not they think that that's, you know, and this is going to be a potential area of concern because this is an area where bias can play in in a really big way. And it can really be the situation that if you're the wrong skin color, the police might be more inclined to think domestic violence, assuming, you know, if that police officer has internal biases in their head and less inclined to accept, you know, a, an explanation that it was just an argument or just um, watching TV or whatever else. The preconceived notions in that officer's mind will weigh into that. And whatever that police officer puts in their report as what they think is going on. If they say, I attended a noise complaint, everyone involved denied domestic abuse, but I think that there was violence here before, you know, before I got here and people just weren't cooperative. If the police officer puts that in their report, you're going to lose your guns. And, you know, if you're indigenous, you'll lose charter protected hunting rights, but, you know, you might you might be a sustenance hunter um lots of sustenance hunters both indigenous and non-indigenous so you might actually need to go hunting in order to fill your fridge and you know at which point you're looking at you know not being able to do that because somebody suspected that you might be involved in domestic violence not were not grounds to believe that not you know just maybe it could be that that's the case. And that's real concerning. Um, as noted, I think that this is going to be applied unevenly. Uh, groups that the police are less trusting of and have preconceived notions of will probably be a lot more likely to face uh, revocations under this than other groups. And there's not really a way, you know, there's the chief firearms officers not going to be able to inquire into this um, it's not relevant for them to do so because they're not required to look into exculpatory things and they've only got 24 hours to do it. And I can tell you, not a lot happens at the chief firearms officer's offices these days within 24 hours. Uh, if you apply to renew your firearms license, it's going to be months or years out. Um, there's certainly no, uh, 
you know, if they've got to do something within 24 hours, they're really not going to have any time to look at it, which makes that whole aspect of, you know, they, you know how they said uh, physical abuse, but excluding the use of reasonable force to protect themselves or another person like self-defense. Well, how are they going to look into a self-defense claim? You know, one person says, oh, um, you know, he hit me and I defended myself. And the other person says, no, I, I was defending myself. Uh, they're not going to have any time to look into that. They're just going to take everyone's guns, gun license away. Um, this is really concerning. And I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, you know, the liberals did this. Um, if I recall correctly, the conservatives were entirely on board with this amendment. So not happy with that, guys. Uh, yeah, there's lots more bad stuff that they put in. So uh, I guess this is the first video of many on talking about the, the nasty stuff that they put in there. I guess next time we'll talk about protection orders and what that means and how basically um, it denies due process to anybody who's a gun owner. Yeah, I've got a lot of videos to make and I'm going to hate making every one of them because they're super depressing. But um, onward we go. All right. Well, uh, now that we've gotten through all of that, um, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for watching. Please like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to see more content. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, the CCFR, Canada's National Firearms Association, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited and Jane Babin Luxor. And at the $20 level, uh, Lindsay Metcalf, Kyle Fox, Haywire, Gerald to the Bailey, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, Vicky, and Brigitte Airdrop. Thank you as well to my $10 supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge. See you next time.